Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to welcome you to the Tuesday, October 9th, 2018 meeting of the Derry Township Board of Supervisors. I'd like to call this meeting to order. If you would please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Of the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do you want have a roll call? Here. 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 I'd like to announce before we begin this evening that the Board of Supervisors met uh, prior to tonight's uh, meeting and executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel issues. I'd also like to remind uh, those in attendance that although it is posted within the meeting room uh, and advising those persons in attendance at this meeting is and has been, it's been the policy of the township uh, to take record all public meetings for the purpose of providing accurate minutes. At this time, I'd like to turn our attention to uh, the first visitor <coughs> comments section. Uh, and I'm going to once again amend the order of presentation a bit this evening in light of the topics to be discussed. Uh, I believe many people in the audience are here tonight to listen to and possibly address the community center issue. And for that reason, uh, the first visitor public comments, I want to limit to any comments besides those pertaining to the community center. What we're going to do is we're going to have the a presentation from Mr. Mendia. Uh, we're going to have questions and comments from members of the board supervisor. And then following that discussion amongst ourselves, at that time then we'll open the floor to visitor public comments. Uh, <coughs> pertaining to the community center. I think that order uh, makes the most sense in light of the presence of circumstances. So with that, I invite anyone who wishes to address the Board of Supervisors on a topic other than the community center to approach the podium. Uh, please identify yourself by stating your name and address. And if you'd be so kind as to limit your remarks to three minutes or less, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. I'm Teresa Peschel and I live at 48 Half Street and I have a question re with regards to Chocolate Avenue. When you are heading east to Palmyra on Chocolate Avenue, there is a left turn lane at Ridge Road and one on Linden Road, another left turn lane, so that you can turn into the new complex at the Hershey Town Square. There is no left turn arrow, however. The left turn traffic has to wait for a break in traffic. The traffic lights look like they are set up so that they can accommodate a left turn arrow. Is one in the future? We're going to need one because already the cars are stacking up as people are trying to get into the new Hershey Town Square development. And since it isn't even finished building out yet, I think we can expect more cars. So will we see a left turn arrow? Thank you. Yeah, we will see a left turn arrow at Linden, but I think, Lauren, you could probably speak to that. Sure, yeah, there will be um, left turn arrows at, at Linden and Ridge as part of the street <coughs> project. Um, those improvements, as you've probably seen, are taking off now. However, um, they're not associated with the work of the Town Square project. So those improvements will occur between now and spring 2019. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address the Board of Supervisors on an issue other than the community center? Mr. Gamble. Yeah, Richard Gamble. I'm just calling or asking again, has there been any discussion or meeting regarding the entertainment tax or amusement tax in Hershey? I think we got to really get serious on this now. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the Board of Supervisors? Uh, hearing none, uh, the next item on the agenda is adoption of the Board of Supervisor minutes for September 25th, 2008, Board of Supervisors Community Center Business Plan meeting minutes. I'll entertain a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Moved by Mr. Ingle. Second by anyone? Second. Second by Mr. Zamuda. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those aye. opposed, and those minutes are adopted unanimously. 
I'll entertain a motion to approve the September 25th, 2008 Board Supervisor minute meeting. <laughs> meeting minutes. So moved. Moved by Ms. Court. I'll second those. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, and those minutes are accepted unanimously. Mm -hmm. First item on the agenda is item A1, the presentation of the design development of the proposed community center. Matt, you care to uh, address the board? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, uh, colleagues, and certainly uh, all the members and residents of our community for being here this evening uh, to hear the presentation of our design development plans for the Hershey Community Center. Uh, much like we've done at all of our previous uh, presentations here related to uh, this project, including a conceptual plan stage or schematic design, uh, stage as well as our design development stage. All of our presentations, including this evening, are recorded and uh, will be posted on the township's website uh, for your future viewing. And as I've mentioned in all of the previous presentations, if you know anyone uh, that wasn't able to be here this evening, please let them know that that resource uh, will be available for them on the township's website. Uh, one last housekeeping, as uh, Chairman Moyer had mentioned, uh, We'll be doing the entire presentation. Uh, after the presentation is done, we'll open it uh, back up for uh, board uh, comment and discussion, and then we will be opening it up for uh, public and visitor comment at that time. If you do have comments, uh, we'll be turning this podium back around and we'll come up to this, to this microphone here for further comments. Uh, before I get into the uh, the slide presentation, uh, some folks that I want to introduce to you uh, that have been very instrumental in getting the project to its current point. Uh, first is uh, Zach Jackson, who is the Assistant Director of Parks and Recreation. Zach has been uh, instrumental in not only the design, but also in uh, the business planning for this project. So uh, we're happy to have Zach here. I also want to introduce three individuals from uh, Kimmel Bogret Architecture and Site, who is uh, the lead architect on the project. Uh, here this evening is Jim Bogret, uh, John Trump is also here, and uh, Torin uh, Miner from Kimmel Bogret are all here. Uh, John and Jim will be presenting uh, this evening the uh, plans, floor plans as well, some interior and exterior uh, renderings, which uh, I think you'll all enjoy seeing. Next I'm going to introduce uh, Greg Kousis. Uh, Greg is from Capital Construction Management. Uh, Greg is our owner representative uh, for the project and has been uh, instrumental in ensuring that we're all moving down the track at the same speed and uh, keeping an eye on budget. We've done budget verification, verifications at each step of the way, as many of you know, uh, conceptual plan uh, stage, our schematic design stage, and certainly in our design development stage here this evening. And uh, Greg will be touching on not only the budget but also the, uh, the project schedule. And uh, lastly, uh, George Dinas is from uh, <coughs> Councilman Hunsaker. Councilman Hunsaker is our aquatics uh, consultant uh, for this project. And uh, George has, uh, as many of you know, and I know a lot of the faces that have been in previous uh, presentations, many of you know there's been discussion in terms of uh, how many larger meets, uh, quantity of meats, what do those meats uh, potentially bring in in terms of revenue. Uh, many of you were here two weeks ago when we presented the business plan and Ken Ballard from Ballard King Associates was here and provided a projection, a conservative projection of what, what he felt uh, uh, those types of meats would bring in. Uh, we've also talked to many, uh, not only local but regional aquatics folks and they had a little bit higher, a little bit more aggressive uh, projection in terms of what those revenues would bring in. George is here and has done some great work and very detailed work, as you'll see, to kind of provide just one more independent review of that topic. And much like everything that we're doing in our business plan, as we continue uh, down the road here to um, opening this facility, um, we're trying to gain as much input and information as we possibly can. So it's great to have George here. 
uh, to go through that topic with everyone as well. So thank you all for, for being here this evening. Once again, I know a lot of folks have been in some of the previous uh, presentations, and uh, you, some of this might be repetitive for you, but I know there's a lot of folks that haven't been to some of them. And we're, we're firm believers that it's very important to continue to understand uh, the, the importance of recreation and the fabric of our community. Where we've been, where we started, where we've come to tonight, and how we've gotten through that planning uh, format. And I think it's important just to spend a few moments uh, to do that. So going way back to the beginning, uh, the facility was dedicated in memory of Milton S. Hershey in 1963 by the Hershey Chocolate Corporation. It was actually operated by the MS Hershey Foundation until 1979 when the township purchased, uh, was given, gifted for one dollar, uh, this wonderful facility uh, by the Hershey uh, Chocolate Corporation. The township has owned and operated this facility uh, since that time and really has been the hub of recreation uh, for uh, all those years. The facility turned 55 years old this year, and as many of you know, as you've been in the facility, it's certainly showing its age in most of, uh, if not all of its infrastructure. So we discussed for many years, um, as we were meeting up, even into the early 2000s, <coughs> we knew there was a day that we had to begin the planning process for what the next generation of recreation was going to be in our community. So that, was, that process was formalized in 2014 when we uh, comprised the stakeholders committee. That committee in, included Derry Township School District, our local and regional swim community, uh, our Moeller Senior Center, the Hershey Medical Center, the Milton Hershey School, and Citizens at Large. And that committee was really charged with brainstorming and creating the foundation and the roadmap for how we were going to proceed in terms of planning for the next generation of recreation. So that group met for some time, and in 2015, the consulting services commenced with Ballard King Associates. They conducted a market analysis. They also uh, conducted uh, several listening sessions where the community came to the current recreation facility and expressed the desires and needs that they felt that this new center should have. And a preliminary program was also established uh, for what this program or what this facility would offer. And that program was discussed, and this is actually the, the current program that's been established for uh, the facility, and, and Jim will be going, Jim and John will be going into more detail as they walk you through the floor, floor plan. In 2016, uh, Jim's team once again uh, went to the next phase and started working on the conceptual plan. Uh, that conceptual plan, once again, was presented right here in this room. And the next step was hiring Ballard King Associates to say, okay, that conceptual plan, what is that going to uh, cost in terms of operational costs? So Ken did a preliminary initial operations analysis, group, which really set the roadmap for what that conceptual facility would be. The board also, at that time, uh, agreed and authorized moving forward with the schematic design. Uh, so from 2016 until this past April, uh, we worked with uh, Kimmel Bogret and all the sub-consultants uh, and uh, came up with a schematic building plan which was also presented right here in this room. In May of 2018, we presented that. Uh, that presentation included floor plans, proposed exterior images, and uh, cost estimates for the project. The next step was the authorization that the board provided for moving forward with design development, which is what we're talking about here this evening. So since May, we've uh, had at least bi-weekly conference calls. <laughs> um, we, we, we've uh, talked a lot, and uh, there's just been a, a lot of uh, cooperation and, and discussion and just amazingly productive uh, discussion as we've gone through the design uh, phase. And uh, I, I can stand here and say that uh, this is certainly one of the largest projects that I've been through and the process and the professionalism uh, that this design team has shown has been, uh, has been tremendous. Through those efforts, uh, the design team was able to pare back in the square footage uh, about 11,500 square feet 
off of the footprint of, of the building, which uh, relates to some real dollars. We've also uh, worked very hard in selecting building and aquatic components, finishes, and exterior materials uh, that offer the best value for the project. And once again, I think Jim and uh, John will be certainly touching on those as well. So with that, um, it's four and a half years of work in about seven minutes. Um, but once again, I, I think we all agree that it's very important to, once again, realize where we've come from. We've had an amazing facility for a really long time, and it's provided some amazing uh, memories and impact on countless people in our community. Uh, but we also realize that we've gotten to the point where we actually have to do something, which brings us to design and development this evening. And uh, with that, it's gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Jimbo Gregg, which we will take you through uh, some of those plans. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, and good evening, everybody. Um, we're starting off, um, I'll play the role of civil engineer <coughs> for the moment. RGS is uh, not present this evening, but I will be touching on some of their uh, site plans in order just to illustrate kind of where things are and where things have been submitted. And, um, and just so we can have an orientation for those who weren't here last time. So um, what we're looking at currently is the existing site if you were up in uh, hot air balloon, you can see the, the current entrance and uh, current facility, uh, Coco Avenue, the existing parking, basketball and tennis courts, and of course, all the, the area beyond this is the high school and to the, to the bottom that's cut off is the, is the library. Um, you know, beyond that, if we keep that in our head and look here, um, some of the things that might be a little different from the last presentation, uh, but have been um, in previous presentations when RGS was present um, was the notion that the parking will remain and we'll use that in its entirety and in fact reclaim this back area that has the, the skate park. There was some question about the, uh, the basketball courts and these are in the plan. They're shown here and they'll remain and um, with, with that being he said the stormwater management now is, uh, has been modified to accommodate uh, maintaining the uh, basketball court. So there's a location here for stormwater management, here below the building, and this one was, was there. Uh, there is one here, and as well as one near Coco Avenue where, where these low-lying areas are. Um, you know, the connections uh, beyond, um, there's, there's been a lot of thought about how this new facility, uh, you know, has a has a more uh, more of an anchor and more connectivity to its surrounding, obviously the neighborhood, but also to the schools and the library. So there's a lot of um, you know, proposed trail here, um, some connections back and in, in looking at the public library, as well as as here to the to you know, the road that takes it to the parking for the softball fields and things. Coco Castle has is, is been something that we're always going to be reusing, and we've embraced that as well. Um, so that obviously will remain. Don't know what's happening to that sound. So we've been looking at plans a lot. I think every single time we've been here, we showed some level of floor plan development. And in general, I just would like to just state before I get into each one is that the plans have been evolving, and I'll use that word uh, as opposed to changing, because change uh, implies that there's something that's going off the, the track here. We're not going off the track. This is something that's been improved and improved upon and through a lot of critical analysis and self-reflection and, and crit criticisms on our phone calls about, you know, why this, why that. So this, this plan has never lost its heart and soul and, and organization, which is this center lobby space, which is our really our community thoroughfare here, um, which then allows the building to sort of connect to it as though this were a major kind of roadway. So this internal connection is, is critical and has allowed all these parts to kind of connect to it, as I said, and I'll take you through these briefly. Um, like I said, the organization has always been that the water, indoor and outdoors, is to the, to the to the south of the main entrance. 
and then the administrative and senior center and multi-purpose room were always in this corner, followed by the gym. Now within that larger construct, we have at the, at the main entrance, we have a check-in reception just opposite the offices here, so that has a nice connection opposite a cafe, um, public restrooms, a stair and an elevator to take you upstairs, and I'll show you the plan upstairs in a second. Um, and then further, as you go back into the building, you end up at this sort of crossroads here where we have a teen center and what we're calling the community living room mm -hmm. in, this, in this sort of lower lobby space. And then nestled back here between the party room and the locker rooms and the gymnasium, we have our child watch and child watch play area, which now has that nice, you know, quick way out if they were ever to use the Coco Castle, which I'm sure they will, as well as getting into the gym for some other more gross motor skill activities. Then, you know, this is sort of protected and nestled in the back of the building. As we move into the senior center, there's multiple classrooms. We talked a lot about that and the value that they have in the community. Uh, the seniors have their own lobby and lobby entrance, um, multi-purpose room, and a kitchen. So all these kind of spaces all sort of intermingle and function together. Um, there are two pool lobbies, one for sort of competition pool uh, spectators. So if you're coming and you're here for a big swimming, you would come in, there's a nice controlled point here, and you'd go up the stairs and you'd have all the seating up looking down onto this pool. If you're swimming laps and if you're a resident, you're probably going to come here through the community living room, down through this pool lobby and into this corridor, which would take you to family changing rooms. We talked a lot about the importance of this really early on many years ago about not having locker rooms per se. So this is sort of the new version of locker rooms, although we still do have locker rooms, and that's really for uh, swim meets and, and for other folks who may not use the uh, family locker rooms. Upstairs we have, um, if you notice this white area below, this is this would be a double height space in the plan, so as you walked in through the main entrance and past the reception and past the, the cafe, you would, you would be in this space. So this is that stair and elevator that I mentioned earlier uh, that would take you up to this landing, which would <coughs> orient you directly into the fitness studio here where we have a lot of equipment, um, as well as a walking track that goes around the building internally here. There are two uh, indoor or enclosed exercise uh, areas, so there's this long one here and this other one above the entrance here. And we have a lot of extra space along these perimeter edges where we can put equipment so you know, we're imagining there will be a lot of windows along this edge and this edge, as well as being able to look out over the railing down onto the space here. And I have some renderings that we have one from the uh, entrance and one from up here. So if you can kind of remember the second floor viewpoint that's about here, we'll, we'll be able to see what that space looks like. So we have a lot more uh, renderings to show than we did last time as we developed the design more and more. We're, we're starting to really understand how this building works spatially, not just in, in the plans. So some of these are sort of refinements and as I said, the, the the building design is evolving. Um, this is the same angle, same approach that we showed in schematic design. The building has changed a little bit, but as we get into the details and understand the materials, uh, the building is starting to express those features. Um, the, the current building and a lot of the buildings in town have this kind of you know limestone uh, skin, um, and we have used that. I think. Um, in very select areas to highlight the architecture of the building. Mm -hmm. And um, when we come down the entrance, you'll, you'll see that. Um, what you're seeing um, is this multi-purpose room that is our sort of indoor pavilion, if you will. So it has this sort of you know, exterior columns like a pavilion might have, but we have this inboard wall that forms the all-season use of that, of that space. So you know, this this feature was, was important to sort of reflect that kind of community um, architecture, if you will. Um, so this is Linda, obviously the parking lot looking back at the main entrance. Uh, so it's a strong architectural statement. It's contrasted by 
you know, glass and stone, so this transparency, this idea of welcoming and heightened uh, the, the point of arrival, which is, which is at this point. What you're looking at in the back here is the, um, this whole sort of this roof sloping that goes here is the really the big pieces that you saw in the floor plan, which is that indoor 50 meter competition pool and the indoor leisure pool. So as we turn ourselves and orient ourselves more towards the entrance, <coughs> we'd be greeted by this. And what you're seeing in the background are the office windows. And so the office space that we showed you in the plan. And then upstairs is the fitness. So this space is east. So we've got a lot of nice uh, morning light. So if you were a morning exercise person, you're going to have that kind of wake up kind of moment. And if you're not such a morning person, you're here at the end of the day, well, then the sun's going to be on the opposite side of the building, so you won't have that blinding western sun. So we think it's a good orientation. The outdoor uh, pool um, is made up of several areas, but there's a zero entry area here. Um, you know, we've been working with Councilman Hunsinger on a lot of iterations, and again, a lot of sort of self criticism on, on what we want. The emphasis has been on water and bodies of water and having. Uh, not such a highly specialized outdoor pool, but having flexibility and open space to allow different kinds of functions. And what you're looking at back here is the um, indoor leisure pool beyond this, and then of course the uh, competition pool would be behind that part of the building. And what you're seeing between the two is a concession stand. I'm sure we're going to have this many people, if not more, in there in the summer. So as I said, we've done a lot more uh, sort of design development in terms of the interiors and trying to show you what it might look like when you arrive. And this is that point of entrance just inside that second set of doors. You see here to the left, that's, that's the sort of the last door that would take you, maybe several of these doors coming off the page, but that would take you to the upstairs uh, spectator area for the competition <coughs> pool area. And uh, a point where we can have um, some, some seating in the immediate foreground here, <coughs> control desk, uh, what we're calling the dairy cafe until it has its donor. Um, but this has that flexible space with, with tables and booths along the back and um, elevator and the public restrooms are, are back here. So you know, this space is, is intended to allow uh, queuing without interfering with a lot of circulation while also providing the opportunity for furniture to spill out here and engage engage what you know is hopefully this this um, this strong uh, you know access that we're showing in, in the floor plan that allows the community to move to and fro into the building. This is really the heart of the building. Mm -hmm. and what you're seeing in the far distance is kind of <coughs> see next time we'll we'll be here we'll focus on this a little bit more. This is the community living room. The blue wall that you see back here is that child watch. So even when you got to this point, you would be able to be oriented and see exactly where you are and what's, a, what's available to you. So as I said, when we're up on the second floor in the fitness center, uh, <coughs> looking back down the stair, back to where we just were, we were standing back here opposite that, that desk, and here you can see those tables outside the, the cafe. You know, we're imagining that this, this um, walking track and this wall, you know, we have the opportunity <coughs> Uh, to have graphics, it may not be this graphic, but the idea that you, that you kind of promote and have these signature kind of um, illustrations on the wall to, to promote wayfinding and awareness in the building. Uh, we'll, we're looking for doing this as much as we can in the building. I think it also adds excitement and uh, certainly tells you what's going on in the building. Mm -hmm. What you're looking at here is, is an overlook that we created this kind of bay window and we thought it was important to uh, engage the lobby from the spectator side. So if you were a visitor and you weren't in the building, but you could have this kind of look through the window and kind of look back into, the, into this, this heart of the building. Um, beyond here the, the, is the one fitness room. Behind me in this viewing uh, position is another fitness room. So this is really all about fitness in the walking track. <clears throat> So quickly jumping down back to the first floor. So we are standing up here, and now we're down just, again, uh, the child watch would be to the left, entrance to the right, 
uh, community living room to my back, and this is that space between the community living room and what we're calling the teen zone. So this is that specialized area that has um, <coughs> dual kind of television, gaming, um, soft seating, kind of here and here, but in the back more kind of bubble hockey, ping pong, and where you see these three lights, there's a high table back here, and that would be like homework and that kind of thing, or just kind of group conversation, group activity. And this yellow uh, piece that you're seeing here, foreshortened, extremely foreshortened, is the, uh, where there would be cubbies and things like that for backpacks and book bags and things like that. Um, you can see that we shaped a stair in a way that we allowed the entrance uh, into the senior center. Uh, so if you're using the classrooms, uh, this would be the way into that. And we think that the stair helps frame and allows that space to, to be uh, featured. You also notice at the very top here, um, we have uh, some filtered light that's going to be able to come into the building. So it's not just this dark uh, sort of cavern uh, of a lobby. So this will hopefully have a lot of nice daylighting in this space. Um, so that when you come in, no matter what time of the year, what time of the day, there'll be some kind of uh, recognition as to you know, where we are, what time it is, and what season it is. Uh, the gymnasium is a single uh, gymnasium, uh, but we do have a lot of cross courts. There's many basketball courts. There's some you know, half, half court basketball around. You'll see here is the walking track that I showed you in the plan. Um, on this corner, if you remember the very first uh, rendering that we showed coming in the entrance, we had this, um, this window wall, if you will. Um, it's a lot of translucent panels with some clear glass here. This is an area where you can pull off and stretch, but we also think it's important to help break up what could be this, this kind of lifeless uh, box, if you will. So this not only helps with the um, sort of sense of breaking down the very big box that you can imagine you can have, being the gymnasium when you first come in, but it, it also uh, gives us some nice filtered daylight in the space. And this would, this is mostly facing north, so it should get nice indirect light. Um, you know, we're, we're exploring some color options. Uh, we haven't really evaluated all the colors and finishes in here. So these are really the kind of first uh, the steps towards uh, having a conversation about what we should have. We selected orange at the moment because it's about energy and kind of something other than tan. And we have a couple of views of the um, indoor uh, natatoria where we have first this is as though you were getting on the starting blocks. And what you're seeing here is the meat management, um, some scoring boards here. So these would be digital scoring boards. And there would be multiple pairs of these because you have the ability to have uh, multiple um, you know, 25 meter um, swim events. Uh, here's the spectator seating that I was speaking about, as well as some on-deck um, participant seating. So if you were upstairs, back upstairs at the spectator seating level looking down, you, you kind of get this overview look of, uh, of the entire body of the water. Um, again, there's multiple uh, scoring digital signage and uh, need management. But you can see that we're starting to really understand how this building is going to be supported and structured. So as we get in more detailed conversations with our structural engineer, um, you're starting to see these elements uh, featured in the building. And the indoor leisure pool, uh, we're not proposing a gold and blue and green. And these are just really diagrammatic so you can see these kind of pieces of equipment. This is the pool uh, slide which goes out the building and back in the building. Uh, this has a zero entry area here by the, by the window wall. Um, lap swimming here obviously, but also some open water here. And a, and a nice play feature inside, you know, it was determined that, um, you know, this was really important to have inside because of the nine months that, you know, and all year round, frankly, of the use that we get. So if you're climbing up that indoor pool slide and looking back down, you, you kind of have this view of what you're looking at. Um, it's the pool party room, and that and this entrance here takes you back to the family lockers and uh, that uh, community center living room, as well as uh, another set of doors here to take you to the more traditional locker rooms. 
So at this moment, um, after orientate, or, orienting you to the building, um, John Trump, uh, the project architect and associate with the firm, will take you through some of the materials and some of the examples. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, again, my name is John Trump. Um, I will be in charge of taking all these beautiful pictures that you've seen here tonight and both getting it into a built reality for you folks if we're uh, so inclined to, uh, to move this project forward. So to build on, uh, on some of the stuff that Jim showed you, I want to uh, just briefly run through some of the uh, exterior materials uh, that we're going to be using in the building. Uh, these are going to be the polycarbonate daylighting panels uh, that you'll see a lot of at the, at the pools. Uh, exterior stone veneer using a uh, product called uh, Exterior Insulation and Finish System, which we refer to as EFIS. Uh, we've got aluminum glass windows, and if you probably noticed, we've got a lot of painted exterior structure. So to get into that a little bit, what are these polycarbonate panels? Uh, you see a lot of them in our pools. They are less expensive than your standard window system, and the as you can see from these images, you can let a lot of light in, but you can't really see out of them. And why this is beneficial in pool areas, we don't cast a lot of glare on the water surface, which is obviously highly beneficial to your lifeguards to be able to see if anybody's in trouble uh, in the water. Uh, again, like I said, less expensive than glass. So as we've been going through this project, I think Matt mentioned earlier, we've been, uh, ever since design development, uh, having lots of phone calls, lots of meetings about how to get the best uh, value for this uh, building, and this is one of the ways we're doing that. Another thing we have on the building, as you saw from what Jim went through, is uh, the manufactured stone veneer. Uh, the top left uh, picture there is the actual material that we're going to use, and you'll see that it marries up very nicely with a lot of the stone that you'll see around town in a number of buildings. Obviously, manufactured stone veneers uh, are quite amazing these days uh, and much less expensive to do than real stone. So again, one of those things that uh, we're doing to make sure that we're getting the best bang for the buck on the building. Uh, majority of the building is going to be uh, EFIS. Uh, it's about one of the most cost-effective materials you'll see on a commercial building these days. The top uh, building there, the uh, white panels. Uh, the top are EFIS. That's a building we did in Hanover Township. Uh, bottom left there is actually Montgomery Township Community Center. Again, those white panels on the left are the EFIS system. Uh, they give you uh, high insulation value. And like I said, just one of the most inexpensive uh, finishes we can do on a commercial building. So we selected that. Probably not much to tell you about an aluminum glass and glazing system. I'm pretty sure everybody's built in a building, a uh, commercial building that has this system. Uh, we try to limit the use of it, uh, find that balance between you know, getting the most amount of light we can into the building uh, because this is probably one of the most uh, expensive items on, on a commercial building is the aluminum glass window system. So using it uh, where it's uh, going to give us uh, the uh, most benefit on our project. And lastly, uh, as I noted, we've got a lot of exposed steel, um, something we do in our office quite often. Uh, building up at the top there is a building in Millersville, and uh, bottom right, <coughs> Iowa Township. Uh, it, it, really gives us the opportunity to add some pizzazz with some color uh, to, to a building and uh, going to use it and it's going to be very nice on yours. And I think that is the last one on structure. Now I'm going to turn it over to Greg and he can talk about uh, cost and schedule. Thank you, John. My name is Greg Kousis, and I'm with Capital Construction Management. As Matt had said, uh, we've been engaged. All right. 
to be the owner's representatives on the project. And so in that role, um, we are tasked with a number of things. Uh, two of the principal <coughs> things are doing the budget verification pricing and developing and maintaining the schedule. So those two things I want to talk to uh, everyone about this evening a little bit. So uh, we received documents, uh, design development documents from Kimmel Pogret in the early part of September and completed design development estimate. Um, at that point where we completed the estimate, roughly uh, September the 18th, we were over budget by about three and a half million dollars. So uh, in the last three weeks, the entire team has worked diligently to try and find solutions to take the project where it came in uh, over budget and get us back to the $32 million budget. And so I'm happy to be able to report tonight that we were successful in doing that. Uh, it took quite a bit of work and uh, some concessions in terms of what was going to be included in the project. We developed uh, a list of 53 different savings options for consideration with the entire team, the township and, and uh, the design professionals. Uh, many of those were taken, as you can see at this point, we're uh, at about exactly $32 million, just slightly under. Uh, as, a, as a part of the effort to get to that $30 million, that $32 million, uh, the plan and the building has gotten a little bit smaller. Some of the materials have been changed uh, to make the budget numbers work. But uh, that's where we are in terms of the overall budget. And that $32 million is a complete project cost that includes both the soft costs and the construction hard costs and a contingency. So all the design fees, all the ancillary soft cost fees in terms of furniture and equipment are included in that total budget. Before I get off of the costing and start talking about schedule, I, I did want to just point out a couple of other things relative to budget. Um, we have been engaged on the project since uh, soon after Kimmel Begret was brought on board. So, so we've had the opportunity to budget the project at both uh, a, schematic, a conceptual stage and a schematic stage and then again at design development. Um, at the schematic stage, we were again presenting almost a $32 million project. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I think we were at $31.7 million at that point. Um, so the project had stayed relatively consistent in terms of the overall budget. The square footage and the cost per square foot has varied a little bit uh, over the course of the project. And one of the things I did want to point out to everyone for just comparison and benchmarking uh, the total construction cost on the project right now is about $248 per square foot. So for people who uh, are, are well-versed in commercial construction projects, that uh, number may sound like it is right in the reasonable range for a commercial building. One of the things that's really important to point out is uh, this line item under 13 called special construction which is $6.4 million. <coughs> that $6.4 million is, is really all of the pool components. So it's the construction of all three of the pools and all the pool amenities. Uh, so when we look at $248 per square foot minus the cost of the pools themselves, uh, it's the outdoor pool, the leisure pool, and the competition pool, uh, the building's about $190 a square foot. And, and um, so for a commercial building of this size, this scale, and this construction uh, at $190 a square foot benchmarking, the cost per square foot is relatively low to what we're used to seeing. Um, we would normally see projects that are all in excess of $200 a square foot. I think that's a testament to the design professionals and how they've been trying to um, efficiently design the facility and the structure and to the township as well for um, participating in those efforts and trying to make decisions that are uh, responsible with the construction costs for the building itself. 
So from budget, I want to talk about schedule a little bit. Uh, some of this information that's here is historical. Uh, as Matt pointed out, he's sort of done the roadmap for where we were and where we got to. Uh, what this slide in particular is the pre-construction schedule, which means basically all of the design and engineering activities that have to happen to get the building to a position where it can be constructed. Um, there is uh, a few key dates that are up here. Um, and for anybody who's taken a look at this, and this is a Microsoft project schedule, uh, just by way of explanation, durations in Microsoft project are working days. So when you see uh, a duration of five, that's a week. When you see a duration of 20, that's a month. Um, so we have uh, the schedule here is showing a slippage of about two weeks. From the last schedule that we presented, we had been anticipating that we would be out to bid earlier in January and be back to the board with approved, or not approved, with uh, bid results for their review and approval to have the project proceed on February 26th. Now that's showing March 12th. Uh, again, that two week delay is really the product of our budget verification being over budget and even take some extra time to figure out how to get the project back to the $32 million budget. So the, the next steps um, tonight is the presentation. If the board so chooses to authorize the team to move forward with construction documents, the construction documents would be completed. It would be put out to bid to the contracting community in January. We would receive bids at the end of February. Uh, we'd be able to evaluate those bids and come back to the board in March for a final decision to move forward with the project. Uh, proposed construction schedule. This is a little more detailed. In the past, we had just a couple of bars that showed an overall duration uh, during the course of the design development process. I've taken the construction schedule and broken it down into actual construction activities. <coughs> this is something that we will probably include in the bid documents if we, if we proceed um, as a tool to inform the bidders as to what the expectations are from the owner in terms of what they're going to be um, <coughs> expected to build to. It shows a start date in April 1st of 2019. Um, at this point, because we're now pushing an end date past the end of May for the entire building, we've been talking a little bit about a phased approach to opening the, uh, at least the exterior pool facility for sure by Memorial Day 2020, uh, and then the final building might open a little bit after that. And we've taken into account um, structural steel deliveries, fabrication, this is a big, big, big steel job and that's going to be a, a significant part of the schedule, getting the foundations getting ready for the steel and having the steel delivered and directed. So we, we've laid that all out in the schedule here. feel that uh, it's all reasonable and it is uh, you know, an attainable schedule. So with that, I think we are done with uh, our presentation. I think at this point we're going to turn the presentation over to George. Go back to Matt. Uh, such as this one. Uh, 
Uh, we were founded in 1970 by Doc Councilman, who's a legendary swim coach for Indiana uh, University. We're a small firm, 28 people based in St. Louis, and we also have offices in Dallas, Denver, and Los Angeles. Uh, one thing we do like to note is that we only touch projects that include chlorinated water. And so while uh, we work on uh, pools primarily, and really that's all that we do, and so uh, it allows us to really hone in and specialize on just aquatic facilities. The majority of us are uh, former or current uh, swimmers, uh, water park operators, uh, water polo players, and uh, we love aquatics, that's all. Uh, that's all that we do. And so what we've been tasked with uh, over the past couple of weeks is, is number one, looking at the, at the need, looking and conducting research on the types of competitive events, participation levels, uh, what that translates to and to uh, terms of the number of events and market rates, uh, as well as economic considerations. And then we've uh, put together a plan uh, just that it includes the number and types of meets uh, as well as the participation rates, and we've uh, you've seen there on the graphic to the to the right. We've talked uh, with obviously the, the township, with the Hershey Aquatic Club, the West Shore YMCA. Uh, talked with Middle Atlantic Swimming, the, the Hershey Harrisburg Sports and Events Authority uh, throughout our uh, research. Uh, I know that we have extensively covered the building footprint uh, already tonight, but one thing I, I would like to note is obviously we have the Olympic sized pool, which is the 50 meter by 25 yard. Uh, competition pool with a single bulkhead in the middle, which allows us to do not only long course swimming uh, during that April to August uh, long course swimming, but uh, also a couple of different short course configurations for 25 yard swimming, uh, as well as the 50 meter. And the real value of the 50 meter is not only that it can host the Olympic distances during the summer uh, long course season, but it adds that daily capacity uh, throughout the year, and so you can get you know 20 short course lanes every day which gives you the, the ultimate flexibility of an aquatic facility uh, because you can have uh, swim teams, public swim, the higher level swim lessons going on in the, in the colder pool which is the 50 meter pool uh, but then also you have uh, you know the the balance of having that warmer shallow water uh, where we have an additional four 25 yard lanes uh, that can be used for water fitness, water aerobics uh, and as well as uh, all types of swim lessons and aquatic uh, programming and that's really what we see the trend is to have multiple bodies of water so you can uh, attract all of the aquatic user groups and uh, keep them comfortable. Uh, what we find in facilities that only have one uh, body of water is that they have to keep it at 84 degrees and so everybody is equally unhappy and so uh, we do not want to see that. We want the, the competitive swimmers to be able to have colder water. We want the uh, leisure and program swimmers to have uh, you know, the, the warmer water and uh, as well as the four lap lanes uh, really comes into play when it being an attractive facility for long course meets as well as those higher level meets where you could run two 25 yard courses in the con competition pool uh, because now you have essential warm up and cool down lanes uh, for those uh, larger meets in addition to the spectator seating upwards of 700 people uh, as Jim noted uh, going through the uh, plans a minute ago. Uh, in looking at Middle Atlantic Swimming, so USA Swimming is broken up into LSCs, which are local swim clubs. There's a map there on the right uh, that shows all of the LSCs across uh, the country. USA Swimming uh, membership has grown 25% uh, since 2009, upwards of 354,000 swimmers uh, at the moment. Uh, within Middle Atlantic Swimming, uh, there are 138 swim clubs, over 11,000 swimmers. That's closely approaching uh, 12,000 and over 200 meets uh, per year. That's really just for the kind of eastern, central to eastern Pennsylvania and uh, portions of New Jersey as well as uh, Delaware. Uh, so close to 12,000 swimmers, uh, 200 meets per year. Uh, the demand is out there for, uh, for indoor facilities for competitions. And meets range anywhere from 200 to, to 1,000 plus uh, swimmers. And, and USA Swimming, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, is really what we would correlate to uh, select soccer or select baseball. It is the highest level of competition uh, for children uh, under the age of 18 that uh, swim competitively. Uh, we also balance that with a couple of other areas. There's obviously high school swimming, collegiate swimming, uh, as well as YMCA. The high school season typically runs fall uh, to spring. Uh, their swimming and diving championships are being held at Bucknell University the next uh, two years. 
Uh, and what we have found through our research is that the township of Derry would be a very attractive location for that swim meet to ultimately uh, come over here uh, at some point. We also look at collegiate swimming, not only NAIA, but Division two and three. And, uh, you know, for instance, the Pennsylvania State Athletic Conference uh, is, you know, would be, this would be an attractive facility for them to host meets at uh, at some point in the future. Uh, as we've seen with other kind of smaller Division two and three conferences throughout the country, they're really looking for an indoor 50 meter facility, uh, anywhere from 500 to 800 spectator seats to hold their conference meets. Uh, and then the YMCA is also a key player uh, in this area with their Eastern, Western, and uh, Central uh, District Championships as well as, well as uh, state and national level meets uh, that can be uh, bid on and, and hosted by 50 meter facilities with this type of spectator seating. The uh, Eastern uh, Championships were held at GCIT in New Jersey this past year. And then the Central Championships were actually held in uh, York, Pennsylvania, uh, the Graham Aquatic Center, which we'll show a picture of here in just a minute. And so those are two meets that are very uh, local that uh, this facility can also uh, play a part uh, in hosting. Uh, and as I mentioned, a couple of other different facilities. We've uh, seen a variety of facilities within this area. This is just a snapshot of uh, the pictures, uh, kind of left to right. So Graham is the top left, and then Cumberland Valley is the, the top right, Bucknell, uh, to Rowan University, Upper Dublin, Millersville. And just to give you an idea of the types of facilities that are out there, the types of facilities uh, that are hosting meets within the middle uh, Atlantic region. Some of these host uh, meets a couple of times a year. Others like GCIT uh, host numerous meets per year. And, uh, so what we found is that uh, there really is a, uh, a need, you know, specifically within this area for a, a 50 meter uh, competition venue for these types of meets. And so this just gives you kind of a layout of where those facilities are uh, in relationship to uh, the township of Derry. Uh, some of the feedback that we've heard here over the past few weeks, uh, the first I think is a, uh, a very telling statement that the Middle Atlantic uh, local swim club is swimmer rich but facility poor. And this actually came from multiple sources that we, we spoke uh, with during this process. Uh, we also found that these regional uh, swim meets, that they average in between 25 and 50 percent of non-local uh, participation. Uh, and currently this area really isn't able to pursue some of those larger meets because of the lack of the uh, indoor 50 meter by 25 yard uh, facility. Uh, also realizing that a majority of the short course meets right now uh, are run by school district pools, but only 20 percent of those have the warm up and cool down pools. Uh, for the swimmers and so the swimmers sprint their hearts out and they don't have a chance to, to cool down they just have to get you know go rest for 30 minutes and get right back up on the block without the ability to warm up uh, and cool down and as I mentioned Franklin Marshall GCIT and Bucknell are the primary indoor 50 meter uh, facilities within uh, this local swim club uh, we also found that a couple of the the primary clubs in the area the Hershey Aquatic Club and the West Shore YMCA that I mentioned earlier uh, have been hosting meets uh, collaboratively together. They have a wonderful reputation across the, the region of hosting uh, meets that are well run and finish on time, which are the two most important things if you're a swim mom or a swim dad, to, have, to swim dad is to have a meet that's well run and that finishes on time so you can get out uh, and enjoy your day. And uh, they actually have, you know, a, have signed a letter of support uh, to help this facility meet the, the goals for uh, competitive events uh, once it is open. The graphic there on the right is uh, very small, and I apologize for that, but uh, this is the number of meets just from September to March within the Middle Atlantic region. And so I mentioned earlier that there's over 200 swim meets uh, that occur in the Middle Atlantic region per year. Uh, this is only uh, half of those meets uh, that occur uh, you know, in, within about a six month uh, time frame. And so what we found also in talking with the sports authorities that they uh, they do have a budget to help with marketing and promotion and can serve as a liaison uh, to the swim teams to, to get people in hotels and to eat at restaurants uh, and to go to you know leisure activities throughout uh, the area. We would also see an impact not only on the number of people that could come to events in this area but also on the uh, participation levels with the local uh, swim clubs. We find this is a common trend across the country that uh, swim clubs really have to cap their membership because there is just limited uh, lane space. And so right now, uh, we can definitely see the, the local clubs 
you know, increasing in number, which, which is only a good thing to get kids uh, in the water and swimming and, and healthy uh, and active. Uh, we've also seen that not only some of the swim clubs have to cap their numbers, but some of the swim meets have to be capped as well. Um, specifically, a couple of long course meets in the summertime, uh, West Shore and Hershey will, will cap the meet at 800 and it, it fills up within uh, you know, a few weeks of, of putting the registration uh, opening uh, out there. Uh, and then also we find that there's uh, really a, a minority of teams within the Middle Atlantic that are actually able to host swim meets, 46 out of the 138 clubs. And that kind of goes back to that swimmer rich and facility poor uh, statement that we heard from a variety of sources uh, throughout the study, that there is just not enough facilities to host the quality facilities to host the number of meets uh, that are out there. Uh, and so when we look at competitive swimming in terms of hosting events, there's really two key players that we find uh, have to be, uh, that are essential to, to hosting meets. The first is obviously an aquatic facility. You have to have a facility. Uh, but then also you, you have to have a, a local swim team. And I thought, I'll kind of explain the differences here uh, when we look at both expenses and revenues for both of those uh, entities because uh, obviously, the swim team can't host a meet without a pool, uh, but the pool typically cannot host a meet without having uh, a team that is knowledgeable in, in running a meet and getting registrations for a meet, and also that has a volunteer force of parents that are able to uh, run the, the, the heating area for the swimmers that are able to have three uh, timers per lane that are able to bring crock pots filled with chili for the coach's hospitality room uh, that are uh, able to fill out ribbons and medals by hand at the end of the day or stick meat manager labels uh, on the back. And so it's really a symbiotic relationship that has to occur when you have these large scale meets that can be run. Uh, on the expense side, the aquatic facility, obviously they have expenses in terms of pool operation and personnel, building operations, custodial. Uh, and maybe you can even consider, you know, quote unquote, lost revenue as part of, of an expense. Uh, but the good thing for an aquatic facility is that it's going to be open uh, whether there is a swim meet there or not. So a lot of those expenses are not specific to a swim meet. You might see, you know, a higher level of, of personnel <coughs> cost, which the business plan uh, has accounted for to make sure you have people that are there to, to clean up the facility afterwards and, and enough to clean up the facility during uh, the swim meet. Uh, and then the primary income uh, stream for the aquatic facility is going to be the pool uh, rental fee. Uh, we see a nationwide average for a swim meet uh, is typically in the forty-five hundred to maybe even eight to ten thousand dollar range. We've used forty-five hundred to six thousand uh, dollar range because that's similar to what some of the other facilities in the region um, are charging. Now on the swim team side, uh, they have the expense of obviously the pool rental, the hospitality. Uh, advertising and printing of, of heat sheets as well as a, you know, paying officials, awards, any equipment that is uh, used for the swim meet. Uh, but then they have a couple of different income streams and in the, in the, what the facility has. They have obviously the splash and insurance fees, which is going to be, you know, say $6 per swimmer per event. Uh, they're going to sell uh, heat sheets. They may, might charge for spectators. Uh, concessions, retail, and spectators, those are ones that sometimes they go toward the, the facility, sometimes they go toward the swim team, and so that's something that's kind of to be determined at this point uh, for this facility. Uh, but I wanted to overview those, those primary two areas because uh, really the two have to work together uh, in order to have a successful meet. You need the facility on board and you need the swim team on board. Uh, and as I mentioned, a couple of local swim teams have already uh, stepped up and said yes, we would we would more than uh, you know love to champion the idea of hosting uh, competitive events at this uh, facility throughout uh, the year. And so uh, where we've kind of landed at this point, I mentioned you know we've been working on this uh, for a few weeks. Uh, that uh, this facility, uh, you know, and we would say easily could host 12 to, to 14 events uh, per year, which could be in the range of 34 to, to 37 event days. Now those, those meets are going to range in size. Some of those, you know, might be smaller uh, dual try uh, or invitational meets that say have under, uh, under eight teams involved and maybe three to 400 swimmers. Some could be more mid-level that might have uh, in the range of 600 swimmers and then the larger scale meets could have 800 uh, to 1,000 members. And so uh, a lot of these meets will not completely overrun the facility and will not take away the entire pool from the uh, membership base 
uh, for the community. In fact, we've seen uh, a number of facilities like this that have the, the shallow leisure pool sectioned off of the main competition pool. If it's a short course means uh, the facility can still run swim lessons, water aerobics, uh, water fitness, uh, as well as lap swim in the, in the leisure pool while having a, a meet over on the uh, competitive side. Uh, and so when we start to look at the number of meet days, the number of total events, uh, that could be in excess of 7,000 swimmers over the course of a year that would get to come and enjoy this facility. Uh, that could be upwards of 25,000 uh, spectators that, that are bringing their children uh, to the community. Uh, and I mentioned the rental rates there of $4,500 to $6,000 uh, per day, uh, which in turn uh, could be close to $184,000 in projected revenue uh, by, the court, by the time you factor in the uh, rental rates uh, times the number of swim meet days for the facility, uh, as well as the variety of types of meets. It's not just USA <coughs> Swimming, it's not just high school, uh, it's not just collegiate or YMCA, it's really bringing all of those events uh, together at the facility to make it uh, a successful place to host competitive uh, swimming events. Uh, a couple of other things briefly I wanted to mention uh, as, we, as we wrap up some items for uh, you know, future consideration. Uh, what we find is that year one is, is you know, similar to year one in any type of business or facility. You're still trying to, to learn the ropes and see uh, how the facility functions and uh, what is, what is the, 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 the proper size for a swim meet for the facility. And so we would typically say, okay, year one, you know, schedule meets. Uh, don't go, don't go overboard, but you know, schedule a decent number of meets, decent size, see how they run, and get a feel for. Yes, we could take 100 more swimmers at this meet, or no, hey, let's scale back, and this should be a one or two day meet instead of a three day meet. Uh, and then after that, you know, starting year two, that's when the facility uh, it gets into kind of its groove and hosting competitive events, and we see that we can start going after some of those Eastern Zone meets or sectionals or, or futures or even a pro series event. Uh, you start to develop partnerships with local businesses and attractions that, that help uh, bring people to, to Hershey and, and the township of Derry, uh, but also keeps them here and they, they spend their money and you know, there's a good, uh, good amount of economic impact that comes uh, through them eating and uh, you know, going, to, going to Hershey Park and, and doing all the other things uh, within the area. Uh, we've also found that inviting some of the larger teams, maybe from the Philadelphia or Baltimore area, it could be a, uh, a good strategy in the first couple of years. You invite those larger teams, they come, they just that just enhances your reputation of running a good meet, and then they start to other teams, and then all of a sudden you have uh, a good, uh, you know, well-known facility that can handle these types of meets, and as well as looking at other types of championships meets. I, I, I haven't even mentioned United States Masters Swimming yet, or, or triathlons as well, and those are just more things that this facility can offer uh, to a, again, a, uh, an area of the country that is, uh, you know, swimmer rich but uh, facility poor. Uh, and so we worked with, uh, with Matt and the, the supervisors as well as uh, Ben Kavenstein to update the, uh, you know, the pro forma profit and loss statement. So you'll see uh, right now as it stands, uh, is again, this is kind of a living and breathing document as, as we continue through the process. The revenues for the facility are roughly three point uh, two million expenses are three point uh, seven million, which leaves a uh, subsidy of five hundred and twelve thousand uh, dollars at this point that incorporates the latest numbers for uh, the competitive events. Uh, what we found this is roughly an eighty six percent cost recovery rate, so eighty you know mid mid level eighty percent is uh, of the expenses are recaptured uh, with uh, the revenues from the facility from the variety of areas that you see up there from admissions, rentals, programs, uh, as well as other revenues, uh, revenue streams the facility has to offer. And so with that, I will turn it back over to Matt. That's fine. Actually, Mark. Thank you. Do any members of the board have any questions, comments for any of our present, uh, presenters today? Great. Anything? No. Matt. Susan. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'd ask George is, could you comment on, I know you really look at being a competitive component, but could you comment on other revenue? So you're looking at a business plan that's already been done by somebody else. Just your general <coughs> comments in terms of what you see in terms of revenue projection. Because it's substantially higher than what we bring in on our current facility. 
So is that something that we realistically can, can expect or I mean, can you comment on that? Yeah, sure thing. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, our, our firm specifically on the feasibility study side uh, does revenue and expense projections and analysis for uh, both current and future pro projects. Uh, what we typically find is that uh, a little over half of the revenue streams uh, that we could see would, would come in from memberships and then another half would be from rentals and programs. Uh, and that's actually uh, almost exactly what we find here. We find I think 1.9 of the 3.2 uh, in uh, revenues is from memberships, so roughly was that 60, 65 percent, and then the other 35 to 40 percent is program and rentals, and so that would fall right in line with the benchmarks uh, that we would see, uh, as well as the mix of aquatic versus uh, dry land programming for the facility. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Craig, I have a couple of questions, if I will, and thank you very much, uh, George. I appreciate the presentation; it's very thorough. Um, you mentioned that uh, there was an recently um, an anticipated uh, cost uh, estimate done, uh, which was over the projected $32 million. Um, and as recently as October 3rd, that was actually um, a little over $4 million over $32 million. It was $36,039,703. 36, Is that right? Before we cut we, some of the things. We, uh, as, as over the course of the last three weeks, we have been revising, revising uh, and refining some of the actual estimate numbers. So in addition to the three and a half million dollars worth of savings that we have talked about in terms of true scope reduction, um, we've gotten some additional input on some of the building costs and that, that's affected Excellent. the base estimate. And to help me understand this, um, Greg, now, We've been at this for a couple of years now, and the initial cost estimate was approximately $32 million. Um, and that was before the steel tariffs were implemented. Um, and since the steel tariffs have been, been implemented, we're still at $32 million. Can, can you explain for me how? Again, uh, so one of the cost escalators that we saw in that 30 $6 million estimate originally that we did for the design development was I added money in for steel tariffs. Um, I also had taken a relatively conservative approach to the structural steel cost. I got some feedback from uh, fabricators and so I adjusted my estimate down to closer to what the fabricators were telling me actual costs were in the marketplace today, in, in, inclusive of all of the steel tariffs. Now, that doesn't mean that the steel tariffs don't have any effect on the project. They do. Um, and, and our estimate was that it was somewhere in the neighborhood of $250,000 worth of cost. Now, I, I understand um, that one of the uh, 53 items that were uh, parsed out of the original cost estimate included uh, the foundation system, the geotechnical analysis of the foundation of this building. Is that, is that right? That is part of the cost. Yeah. Savings and, that we um, and in an effort to uh, save approximately $1.2 million, the foundation <coughs> system was revised from mini piles to soil improvement with compaction, grouting, and <coughs> aggregate geo piers. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And today I was provided a uh, geotechnical engineering report uh, provided by the ARM group. And uh, was was the foundation system uh, revised to reduce the cost of the geotechnical work anticipated to be done on this? Was the estimate revised to represent the methodology of shoring up the foundation of this building revised? <coughs> so, without getting into uh, a 45 minute dissertation on right. the foundation system. We'll see if I can do this in two or three. Okay. Uh, the original concept that was um, applied to the foundation systems mm -hmm. was a spread footing system mm -hmm. with some soil improvement. That's what we had anticipated at the schematic stage, and the structural engineer had validated that that was a reasonable approach. Okay. Uh, subsequent to the geotechnical testing being done, uh, the geotechnical engineer came up with a recommendation of looking at a micropile system. Mm -hmm. and 
we priced that as part of that original budget, uh, which was $2 million worth of uh, subsoil foundation system. Uh, subsequent to the initial pricing, we looked at two other alternatives. One was a much more comprehensive injection grouting and overburden replacement regimen. One was a modified mini pile and grade beam system. So in terms of cost of all of those systems, the mini pile system, $2 million, the modified mini pile system, a million and a half, the injection grouting and overburden replacement, $800,000, and the original system was $350,000. Okay. So what we have included in the budget at this point is the compaction grouting and overburden replacement. Now, as part of that analysis, discussion, and resolution in terms of that being what is included in the estimate and in the budget. Um, we've had multiple discussions with the geotechnical engineering team and the structural engineering team, uh, as well as participation from the members of the township to understand the differences between those systems and the relative um, benefit and cost of each of those systems. Yeah, I mean, obviously our concern is that the foundation not collapse like we had with the ECC and obviously result in significant uh, engineering remediation efforts. Um, was this geotechnical analysis peer-reviewed by anybody? It has not been yet, but we have discussed that as being a potential um, recommendation going forward. Okay, so the $1.2 million reduction out of the $36 million estimate that was previously rendered is uh, forecasting that that peer review um, will yield a geotechnical system that's acceptable and, and safe. We, we have already discussed that with ARN and the system that is being budgeted at this point um, they are comfortable with as a structural engineering system. What they wanted to make sure that they communicated to the project team and to the owner is that the micropile system is the only system that eliminates any risk of subsidence in the future. And that's not the one that is in this budget? That is correct. The one that's in the budget eliminates most of that risk. Okay. Um, I also see that uh, the uh, reduction in, in down from the $36 million design development estimate um, eliminates the pedestrian connection from the high school parking lot eliminates the splash pad, um, eliminates the connector road to the Dairy Township School District, and eliminates the library entrance parking modifications. Is that, is that right? Actually, that, that, that is not accurate, Mark. That was one of the earlier versions that we were working on. Okay. But uh, part of the information that I got late in the estimating process from the structural steel fabricator mm -hmm. allowed us to realize some savings on the structural steel estimate that I had included earlier. And none of the connection issues um, with the school district properties nor the parking lot need to be removed. Excellent. Because Excellent. that was obviously a the great, great aspect of the, the The splash pad is one of the saving suggestions that we are recommending okay. going forward. Right. And I, I guess the, the splash pad was one of the aspects that kind of set this project apart from being just an Olympic swimming <coughs> Then you do a more community-oriented aspect. Um, is that a material change, do you think? I'm going to pass that question to from the yeah, I, should, okay. <laughs> I, I, I can speak to that. And obviously, during this process, the last several weeks, we've, we've had to make some pretty significant uh, decisions. Right. And uh, we felt that with both the outdoor uh, community pool as well as the indoor leisure pool, that both of those pool structures have zero depth entry areas, uh, which will provide plenty of space for particularly the little people uh, to, to really enjoy. And uh, with a $200,000 price tag for that splash pad, uh, we felt that it was prudent that uh, we weren't really impacting the program, being that they had two other areas that they could enjoy. Uh, in the shallow water. Okay. And there st are still some splash features in the outdoor area as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, Greg, are some of the uh, fitness 
um, rooms being modified in order to reduce some of the costs? Uh, we have looked at a revised layout for the second floor of the building, which takes some square footage out of that area. All right. That's the floor plan that Jim had showed tonight. Okay. Uh, so the floor plan that was presented as part of the floor plan layouts is the floor plan that reflects that uh, roughly 1,450 square foot reduction in the second floor area. So what we saw tonight is what is currently planned? Correct. Okay. And the walking track, that's, has that been reduced in distance? As part of that second floor square footage reduction, is slightly smaller now. Right. Now, Greg, in, in your uh, experience, um, is there a provision for a price not to exceed uh, as part of the contract in this? In other words, with change orders and everything that, that could ordinarily be expected of a project of this magnitude, um, and a $32 million revision as we have tonight, is there, is, is it normal industry custom to get a, a price not to exceed from multiple prime projects like this? I don't believe that's an option. This is a multiple prime project. You're going to put it out for bid. You're going to receive bids. You're going to evaluate the bids. If you're happy with the proposals and you vote to proceed with the project, mm -hmm know what the starting price is and yes there should be some expectation that along the way there's going to be some change orders as part of the construction process that's normal for every construction project. Okay. I was going to follow up on that. Actually, I mean, you probably already answered it. Maybe it's more of a question for Greg or for Jim. Is that what you've experienced in the past building similar facilities? You know, as you go through the process, I mean obviously we've, we've evolved the project already. Uh, we would just continue to make those changes as we move forward as we have more information in front of us. Is that how this would work. Well, yeah, but there's also a project contingency. There is a project contingency that's built in as part of the budget. Yes. And that would be the first place when changes occur. Yeah. That's the first place. <coughs> is there a percentage of the total contract price that's a contingency? Five percent right now. Five percent. Okay. Uh, those are the only questions that, that I have. Um, if there aren't any more, I'd like to open the floor up uh, to questions and comments from uh, our public on this issue. Thank you very much. I appreciate your candor.